Luke, who talks about, Jesus talks about the two men that prayed. There's two types of men. And I, the reason I want to mention this to you, because I, I kept going from one to the other. But there's the Pharisee that had the prayer, God, I'm glad I'm not like those people. And there's the tax collector that said, God, wouldn't even look, couldn't even look up, beat his breast, said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. One was humble, one was prideful. And that's where I go back and forth. Well, when I was doing my devotion, I really was connected. I was humble. I was being that God had mercy on me, a sinner, and the great attitude. And then for some reason, a couple of days later, I really got into that Pharisee, like, I'm glad I'm not like those people. I've learned a lesson. I've, I've mastered this. I don't have a conniving tongue. I've, I got, and so I went out, and of course, God in his, uh, in his loving care absolutely made one of the worst days of my life. I went on the golf course. It was the worst day of my life. I was so bad. I was talking about people, not behind their back, but in front of them. In front of them. I'm not kidding you. We pull up on the hole with two guys I'm playing with. I couldn't stand them. I'm talking to the guy in the car. And everybody waiting on the team boss could hear me. In fact, the guy next day, I'm sitting at, brec uh, at breakfast, and the guy that's running the group asked my brother, said, no, Wayne, did you talk to Gary? He said, no. And Thad looked at me and said, Gary, he said, you can't do that. And I went like, wow. And I said, man, I need to apologize to these guys. And I also had to apologize to Thad because I was talking about him the whole day behind his back, but he not in front of him. So I went like, wow. So, I, so my initial response was anger, frustration. And then I said, then it became understanding. I said, God is showing me that I, I, I came from being humble to prideful. I got in the way. And so it brought me right back to being humble. And so then I became thankful and joyful and at peace. And I went, really? Great. I've learned that valuable lesson. I apologize to the people and, you know, and it's all good. So then I got back into it. And then I really said, I, I became the, you know, I became the tax collector again. I was connected. God, I was humble. And don't if I didn't do it again. I, I, I got this prideful, boastful attitude that now I've really learned that lesson. I'm glad I'm not like those people. And what do you think God did? Two days later, it was the worst I've ever had in my life. It was even worse than the, the time before. And so, but fortunately that day, my response time, I turned it around in the middle of the day. We, played, we had to play 36 holes that day, and the first morning, and during the morning was just horrible. I was out of control. And then I really went through the, the, the motions of anger, frustration. I'm never coming back. I don't want to play with these. I really went through all those things. And then I realized that God was teaching me a valuable lesson, and so I, I apologize. So my point there is we, we do that, and I think it's good news for a lot of us younger Christians that we, we're going to stumble. And the, the, the thing that I want to talk about or to mention is the difference between conviction and guilt, okay? They both initially start out with the same thing. When we make a mistake, when I, when I, when I use my conniving tongue, when I talk about you behind your back, that is a mistake. That, I, guilt and conviction both points to that. But the similarities stop there. With guilt, Satan gives you guilt. Guilt doesn't come from God. Satan wants you to think you are defeated. You're worthless. There's no need to, you, you might as well give up. You just, you can't, you can't get this. Conviction, on the other hand, is from the Holy Spirit and says, you know, I know you stumbled, but it's with God's loving care that I'll pick you back up. And I don't care. It's not how many times you stumble, because as you can see, I've stumbled seven times on this message. I might stumble. It might take me 17 times. But with conviction, it's, there's hope. It's, it's loving care, it's, it's loving discipline, and with guilt, it's wanting you to be defeated, wanting you to uh, not be in the game, wanting you to just be defeated. So uh, over in James, he, t he talks about the uh, trials and tribulations in James uh, one, chapter 1, 2 through 4. It says, uh, consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete and not lacking anything. So it's our respons response to these stumbles that we're inevitably going to encounter in our life, in our journey, in this process, the lifelong process. And uh, the greatest obstacle to following the lead of the Spirit, the greatest obstacle we as sinful people by nature have, 
It is the overestimation of our own capabilities. Every time in both of those examples I talked about whether it's preparing this message or working on uh, my, taming my tongue, every time when I said, okay, God, I got this, thank you, thanks for the lesson, I got it, I got it, every time I stumbled. And I'm so thankful when I stumble because I realize that I'm getting away from God. So our response to God, we can either move closer to God or we can move farther away. And hopefully as we grow and mature, our response will be faster. And uh, I'd like to say that my, you know, after this lesson at Myrtle Beach, I've learned uh, this lesson. I haven't. Uh, just a few days ago, I was with a group, and as you know, guys, we do it a lot, our conniving tongues. We like to gossip. We talk about people behind their backs. You hear it all the time. I was around a group of guys who were really doing it, and uh, I was kind of, you know, I was really proud that I didn't, I didn't give in to it. They, they would come up to me and say, what about old Joe? You know, I don't care about him. You know, he's this and he's that. And I looked at him and I said, I like old Joe. And I really, and then I walked away, I kind of pat myself on the back. I said, I'm proud of you, Gary. And I really felt like I was, you know, reflecting God's love. And they said, man, something strange about this guy, you know, I went in a good way. And so I was proud of myself. But lo and behold, by the end of the day, I did the same thing again. This is like three or four days ago. Same thing again. All day long, I was being good. And then I became prideful and boastful. And at the very last minute, for four hours, I was really good, humble. 30 seconds, I lost it. It was unbelievable. I mean, I really lost it, and I went off. And, you know, it's, what's really amazing is uh, when you do that, not only do you hurt the person you're talking to, but you hurt the people that hear it. You poison them. And, you know, it's amazing how you can, you can go from being humble to being prideful just, just by your successes, just by keeping your mouth shut. It causes me to burn it. So I still struggle with that. But the good news is it's not happening as often. And when it happens, I recognize it immediately, and my response time is getting much, much quicker. In fact, I went back to the guy and apologized, and I, apologized. I had to talk to all the guys and apologize. And he said, oh, it's nothing. To be honest with you, when you're playing golf, you know, we like to, it's, it's really like who wins, as you know, if you play golf or any sports. And so if someone's whining, we call it whining, then that's kind of a good thing. You know, if I'm playing golf against you and I beat you, and you're crying and whining about, blah, 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 you know, I'm just kind of smiling because you're whining because I beat you. And so they didn't see it as negative as I did, but I saw it as poisoning them and not reflecting God's love that I worked so hard all day and thought I'd done a wonderful job. But that was my problem. As soon as I thought about me doing it rather than God doing it through me, I stepped across that line and became the Pharisee, glad I'm not like those people type thing. So the last thing I want to leave you with, I was going to say a lot of younger people, but uh, we've got a few young guys in here, Michael and the, but uh, when I was growing up, Billy Graham was the man, okay? He, in, in my opinion, uh, at that time, he was the most righteous among us. He was the one that we all turned to. And uh, as you know, he traveled a lot and uh, preached and uh, did a remarkable job for the Lord's work. And uh, I guess he's in his 90s now and he's still alive. But uh, it won't be long before he goes with the Lord. But we, I know we, we, I liked him so much that I hated him because we'd be out playing ball, and if he came on TV, you know, our, our parents make us come in, we sit and watch Billy Graham. And, uh, but one thing with Billy, so, you know, I, I got to tell you, as a young person, I thought Billy Graham didn't stumble in sin. I thought he was the most righteous among us. I thought he didn't deal with the issues that I dealt with. Well, I read just a while back, a few years ago, that Billy Graham, when he traveled, before he went into a hotel room, he had his staff remove the TV to remove the temptation to sin. And that tells you someone that's really that devoted and that, what I used to think, so into, so righteous, really has the same problems we have. Now, you would think, well, Billy Graham could just leave the TV in and just not turn it on. Now, I might just turn it on real quick, but I could get snagged, but not him. But Billy Graham had the same has this, deals with the same struggles that each of us do. And so it's part of our simple nature. We're going to go through it, but the most important thing is not that we're doing it, but it's our response to it when it happens. So today,